So, uh, this week we are joined by me, guest host Sam Challoner, and uh, CEO Robbie R- McRobbie from the Hong Kong Rugby Union. Uh, thank you for your time, Robbie. Um, so, a bit of a background to you and how it all began, please. Uh, sure. How you get to where you are? <laughs> Um, well, I, I came out to Hong Kong in 1992. Uh, I finished university. I, I grew up in Scotland, went to, to university down in England, uh, studied history, which was uh, a really enjoyable course. Always loved history, but not particularly vocationally focused. So I didn't really know at the end of my course what what the future uh, had in store for me. So I decided that I would. Um, head overseas and one of my brothers was a police officer in Hong Kong police so I know knew a little bit about uh, about the job uh, and thought that um, that would be uh, an interesting thing to do for a few years there were three-year contracts that they were offering so I did the recruitment process in the UK in London uh, was fortunate to to get selected and arrived in Hong Kong August the 20th 1992 to start nine months at the police training school at Wan Chuk Hang next to Ocean Park. So um, completed the, the training, uh, started my, my police career up in the New Territories, um, worked, worked up there for, for quite a number of years, um, very much enjoyed that. I, I, was, um, I, I was a keen, if not very effective, um, police officer, Sam. I, I actually, I only succeeded in arresting one person during my entire 11 year career uh, and he was burglaring my own flat. So uh, I didn't really keep the streets particularly uh, safe, but had a lot of fun. Uh, and it was a great thing to be doing as a, as a, as a young, uh, young man uh, in Hong Kong, experiencing a different culture and um, language, etc. cetera. So um, I had, had a good time towards the end of my police career, I, I um, ended up as the assistant manager at the police officers club in Causeway Bay. It's actually, it's not um, open at the moment. Uh, I think it, it, it will be rebuilt. Um, it was kind of knocked down as part of the Shartin Central um, Rail Link. It's next to the Yacht Club. Um, so my role there wasn't really anything to do with policing at all. I was organising um, kids' birthday parties and Elvis Presley fan club events and, and stuff like that. And actually, I was much better at that, Sam, than I was being a policeman. Um, but organising events was something I'd always been interested in, in doing. It was something I, I'd been involved with at school and the university. So it's kind of going back to something I was quite passionate about. Uh, so during my time there, I also did a part-time course at Hong Kong New Space in sports and recreation management uh, and decided, this is sort of early 2000s, decided that um, I wanted to look outside of the police and, and look for a, a, a role, a career in, in the sports industry. Uh, I'd always been a passionate rugby player. Um, I played for, for, for years um, uh, and, and started to get a bit involved with, with as a volunteer for the Hong Kong Rugby Union, helping out with tournaments and events and different things. So 2003, they advertised for a position at the, the Rugby Union, a community rugby manager. Um, so I put my name in the, in, in the, in the hat, so to speak. Um, I uh, was fortunate to, to get selected, so started my, my time with the with Rugby Union. Um, and since then, which is what, coming on for 17 and a half years now, uh, I've sort of worked my way through, through the company. So I, I say I, I started off in the community department, I then spent time looking after facilities, looking after the commercial department. I ran Hong Kong Sevens for, for a number of years, um, was, a, was a deputy CEO, and then took over as the chief executive officer uh, just about three years ago now. Um, so that, in a, in a kind of a, a brief nutshell, is, is how I've ended up here. Brilliant, thank you very much. That. So you mentioned there uh, a history degree. You also had uh, some extra education at HKU Space. Uh, and obviously the police career as well. So uh, some really good uh, learning opportunities throughout um, your career so far. And also uh, great to see that you're bettering yourself um, with some academic uh, <laughs> academic rigor as well. Um, a similar back- background to me, I was a special constable with the Metropolitan Police in London previously. So uh, oh, right. uh, it didn't last very long. I realized that policing wasn't for me uh, and I went into teaching. <laughs> so, um, thank you. And, so you, you were made an MBE in the New Year's Honours list in 2020, is that correct? 
Yeah, I, uh, yes, I, I, I was great, great, um, great honor. I, I've, I've not actually got it yet, Sam. <laughs> the um, we, we kind of obviously because of coronavirus and, and, and everything else, um, all of the the ceremonies uh, have been put on hold. So I was I was originally going to go back last year. They they do the investitures um, a couple of times a, a year, and um, because my 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 home is in Edinburgh in Scotland, and my my dad is still um, still living there. So my my choice was to to go back and um, they do one investiture a year at Holyrood Palace in, in Edinburgh. So I was going to go back and 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 get it there. So it was all lined up uh, end of June last year, and of course that never happened. Uh, and they they haven't restarted <laughs> they haven't restarted the investitures yet. So yeah, so I. I on, on paper, I've got it, Sam, but I don't actually, I can't actually show you it because I, I don't have it in my physical possession. You have to keep pestering, pressing the queen, make sure she doesn't forget about it, I guess. So. <laughs> um, and um, so, can you talk me through a little bit about, uh, I'm going to ask you in a, in a minute about your biggest sort of sporting achievement, but um, leading into that, can you talk me through Operation Breakthrough, please? Yeah, so um, whilst I was in the, um, in, still in the police, some um, some friends of mine got got involved with a, a, a youth initiative in Toon Moon, um, and uh, a Scottish expatriate police officer who was the district commander in, in Toon Moon at the time, um, he, you know, he felt that Toon Moon, which which had a, a pretty high youth crime problem, he felt that the way in which the police were tackling it was um, w wasn't particularly creative, and, and it wasn't didn't seem particularly effective. It, it was. Um, very repetitive, so you know, youngsters would be picked up for, for minor crimes, be given um, superintendent's discretion or a warning, they'd be put back on the streets, they, they would, you know, revert to um, sort of the, the previous group of friends and, and what have you. And so, you know, they were ending up in, in the judicial system and going to prison. And so he decided that um, what would be a good thing to try was an engagement between the police officers and, and young people to, to, to change their perception of each other. So they no longer looked at, at one another as the enemy, but actually started to, to develop a, um, an understanding, if not friendship between them. And he, he started off by using officers from um, the, the police counter terrorist unit, Flying Tigers. Um, and they were doing kind of outward bound camps for the kids. So these were kids who'd been arrested, let's say for minor offenses, and they were given the opportunity to spend a weekend out in the hills with um, volunteer police officers, and they were doing things like abseiling and um, you know, night hikes and camping and canoeing. And one of the activities that they did was, was a bit of boxing. Um, and even over the, over the course of the weekend, it was, it was clear that, that the, the interaction was having an effect, uh, that, that the kids were um were developing the bond with the police officers and vice versa and so the youngsters actually afterwards said to um said to the police that they would like to do something rather than occasional weekend camps they'd like to do something on a regular basis and they were keen to do boxing they enjoyed boxing something different so uh a breakthrough boxing activity started on the roof of tying police station there's a couple of um a couple of police officers uh, some sets of gloves and pads uh a handful of kids and that, that went really well. And, and the, the program got bigger. I was, I, I was at the police officer club at the time and I started um, helping them by arranging uh, an annual uh, boxing dinner. So the kids, uh, we, 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 we bought a boxing ring, which we would uh, assemble in the Chinese restaurant. Uh, we would um, sell tickets so people would go and watch, uh, which would then raise money for the project. And the kids would have the opportunity to to have um, boxing matches against youngsters from other boxing clubs. Um, uh, and, and it was you know, a chance for them to show the skills they developed. And it was really, really good. So th this was kind of going on. That, that started in 97. It ran through, as I say, up until, uh, well, 2003, I suggested that, um, that it was working, th this concept was working well in, in boxing, which was an individual sport. Why not try a team sport? And, and rugby seemed to me uh, a great, um, vehicle, you know, with the values on the pinning sport and everything like that. So um, the, the, the guys who were running Breakthrough at the time um, sort of gave the green light, were very supportive. So we started Breakthrough Rugby in uh, 2003. And then over the years since then, it's now become multi-sports. So there's 10 different, different sports, um, everything from dancing and uh, judo and basketball 
Um, uh, and you know, we work together with social work groups. Um, the program is still primarily run by volunteer um, police officers, retired and, and current police officers. Um, and it's been great. And, you know, and, and the, 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 there's been a lot of success stories. Kids have gone on to, we've had a lot of 25 who've gone on to actually join the police or, or fire services or customs. Um, a number of them have gone on to be teachers, social workers. Um, some of them, it, it was never really about trying to develop them necessarily as the greatest athletes, the boys and girls. It was more, you know, trying to have a positive impact on their life um, away from the sports pitch. But some of them um, have done very well on, on, in the sporting uh, field as well. So it, it's been good. And, you know, and with obviously what Hong Kong has gone through over the last um, couple of years, the relationship between um, the police and young people, um, the, it's been extremely difficult and extremely strained. So these types of programs, I think, um, are more important than, than ever. Brilliant. Thank you. I've, I've actually experienced firsthand a, a chap I've coached down at the football club and a chap uh, came through the Operation Breakthrough programme and he represents football club and was, went on tour to New Zealand as part of the IRANS programme and that, that was really successful and he benefits hugely from that. So uh, I've had firsthand experience. Um, great achievement then, setting that up. Um, would that be one of your um, major achievements in rugby or in Hong Kong or do you have any others that you would like to hang on to for major achievements, I guess? That that's certainly been um, yeah been a very special part of of my um, sporting sporting life involvement with with breakthrough um, I, and I think sort of having the opportunity to do it with with friends as well so all of the, all of those that were involved with with breakthrough you know we're all we're all, um, we're all pals anyway and it's it's great to do stuff like that with with, with people that, that you know you know and like and respect um, I suppose the other the other thing in a similar vein so that was that was my first exposure to the concept of using sport uh, as a tool for social change. So it's a sector which, which is um, sort of known as sport for change or sport for development. So it's, it's not about simply growing participation, it's about how you use sport as a medium, as a language to talk to young people uh, and, and help you know, um, tackle social challenges. So on the back of that, when I, uh, when I joined the rugby union, I, I was keen to see how we could do more in this area, more in this, in this sphere. Um, and in 2013, we set up our own Hong Kong Rugby Union Community Foundation, which is a, a charity um, here in Hong Kong. Uh, and that brings together all different programs under this Sport for Change, um, Sport for Development uh, title. And, and, and that for me has been, um, has been fantastic. You know, the, over the years, we, so we, do, we do things like um, deaf rugby, prison rugby, um, ADHD rugby, special education needs, learning English through rugby. Um, a whole range of, of, of different things um, and, and I've yeah had a huge amount of um, satisfaction seeing the way in which that's developed and and, um, and the positive impact that the sport has, has had and the, and the fun and enjoyment that, that it's brought to the lives of, of many many youngsters um, since since we set it up back in, in 2013 so I guess the, the kind of two Two sides of the same coin, very similar sort of thing, breakthrough and, and the community foundation. But yeah, that's the area of, of sport where where my real passion lies, Sam. I, I was, you know, I played rugby not for the Bull Hong Kong national team. I played for, in fact, I captained the A team, the second team, um, not very successfully. And I, and I, and I um, played sevens in, in um, a Phuket international tournament for the Hong Kong development team. So, you know, I, 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 I've had a go at playing sport at a reasonably high level but um i, I think the, the grassroots of community stuff is is, is actually so, something that i've had a lot more um personal satisfaction and pleasure out of um rather than playing at elite level i, I you know i've always loved playing the game but i think that you know that social impact of the sport um to, to me has been yeah has, has been really really important that's brilliant thanks you spoke, you spoke about there creating opportunities for various many many people uh, to get involved in sport and it's amazing once you do uh, step over that fold how much you can actually gain from uh, sport itself and rugby or any or any really um, but that's brilliant thank you um, so what would you say then would be the most important lessons you would say in terms of uh, giving someone who get themselves in the sporting world perhaps going down a professional career um, or, or maybe just enjoying and enjoying sport generally so it's a bit of a two-sided question there but what would, what would be the most important lesson from your experience of being involved in in sport 
I, I think that for um, I think it's probably two two slightly different areas. I mean, the, the for, for those who who are um, looking to pursue a career as a professional athlete, I mean, it, it, I, I can't talk with too much knowledge about that, having never reached those heights myself. But sort of working with me, we obviously we we have um, full time uh, male and female athletes that that that, that we work with. Uh, and, and I mean, that's, that's all about dedication, commitment. Um, y you're never going to reach the heights and, unless you're prepared to just put in the hard work. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's first and foremost what, what you've got to be prepared to do if you're going to go down that path. Um, whether it's, you know, being a golfer and hitting a, getting out there in the driving range and hitting 10,000 golf balls or, or whether it's, you know, Johnny Wilkinson going out and um, practicing his, his rugby goal kicking on, on, on Christmas Day when everybody else is sitting at home, you know, um, opening their presents. You, you've got to have a real, real strong dedication. I think within the sports sector, I think one thing is, uh, well, first of all, I, I would say um, it's important to understand that, that it, it's kind of not all glamour. <laughs> it's not all glamour working in, in, in sport. There are some great moments and great times um, and being part of... Um, big successful sporting events like the rugby sevens and that is absolutely fantastic and when you, you you know you bring a lot of again a lot of, a lot of pleasure to 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 a lot of people but equally there's a lot of um less glamorous times and and um and it's a lot of the stuff that you do is, is very mundane it's like any it's any job it's not all rubbing shoulders with famous um sporting personalities and that so um i i would say that link to that get involved if it's something you think you want to do get involved as a volunteer um understand how the sports industry works um and, and i think on the back of that you will then quickly you will you will understand whether or not this is something that that you genuinely do have an interest in and a passion in doing and and uh, you know there's nothing wrong if you, if you decide you don't want to do it that's great I mean, we do we have apprentice programs that, that we run so we have about uh, well, at the moment we've got nine different apprentices every year, and they're one-year contracts for for youngsters leaving leaving school. Um, and I, I think for me, you know, on the back of it, more than half of of those who've been through the apprentice programs decide they don't want to continue working in sport. They want to go and do something completely different. But that's great. To to me, that's fine because it it means that you know that, that they've at least got more clarity about what it is that they they don't and they do want to do. Um, so if you think you want to work in sport, that's great. Give it a go, volunteer, get involved with a sports club, a sports association, um, uh, a local charity working sport, whatever it might be, dip your toe in the water, experience it. Uh, and then if you really find that it is something you want to do, then just go for it. Give, give, give it your all. And, and again, I suppose similar to, to trying to be a professional athlete, just dedicate yourself to it and, um, uh, yeah, enjoy the ride. I think that the idea of volunteering is a really nice one, actually. Getting involved, trying, getting the experience, uh, and you, you, you're not, you know, you're doing something for personal satisfaction rather than monetary value. And actually, that's a skill that is 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 important to develop in in terms of hard work and a, a work ethic to make sure you are very sure in what you want to do as a career. So, good advice. Thank you. Um, targets for the future then for Robbie, firstly, and then for the rugby union. <laughs> Um, f f from my point of view, I mean, I think that um, for as long as I remain as, as the as the CEO of Hong Kong Rugby Union, you know, my my desire is to try and be the best the best leader, the best manager that that, that I can be. Um, and I suppose the, the wider sort of picture is is a to, to continue to try and live up to um, the union's vision of making rugby a game for all, trying to ensure that that um, Everybody within the Hong Kong community who wishes to to play rugby has the opportunity to do so, and, and is not um, prevented from doing so or precluded from doing so by you know reason of gender or ethnicity or economic background or, or anything like that. So that that's really important. I think the the under and, and doing all that with the pinned by our underlying values of um, of respect, integrity, um, excellence, in, and inclusion, which are all um, values which are you know really important to to me and, and, and the, the, the team here at the union. Um, I, I think for the union itself, but we've come to a difficult period. COVID has, has 
has hit the sports industry um, and the events industry very hard, as, as we're all aware. Um, so it's involved, you know, difficult decisions. Um, we've had, unfortunately, to make redundancies and salary cuts and, and you know, review programs, etc. cetera. Um, and and that's, that's been tough for everybody. So uh, now, you know, we need to make sure that when we come out the, the back the back end of COVID, um, you know, we we're still in a position whereby we can we can deliver um, quality uh, events in the community, and, and obviously we can go back to, to putting on uh, fantastic rugby sevens, which which you know has has been the thing that, that the rugby union has been renowned for uh, over the last 40, 44 years. Um, so so again, you know that that's that's a challenge, but that's something that that for me personally and, and for the rugby union team. I'm confident that you know we're, we're up to and, and and we look ahead to, to the coming months and, and coming years with yeah with, with a we're certainly not being complacent but but I think you know we have um, op optimism that, that we, we are seeing hopefully light at the end of the tunnel of, of the of the pandemic. Brilliant, thanks. So you mentioned the values of the game. Uh, clearly, you are an ambassador of those. Uh, you mentioned some tough decisions that had to be made and your and leadership as well. So um, just holding on to that term leadership, what does that mean to you uh, as a leader yourself? It's my, the way in which I, I lead and manage is, is uh, it's changed quite a lot over the, over the years, Sam. I, when I first started out, initially as a young police officer and then when I first joined the union, um, I, I really, I, I kind of felt I had to do everything myself. Everything was on, my, was on kind of my shoulders, my responsibility. I had to go out there, you know. Um, I think I probably took the concept of um, the importance of, of showing that you're not asking people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself and, and kind of rolling your sleeves up and, and all that good stuff, which is all important, but I probably took it um, to, to the sort of nth degree um, and... And on the flip side of that, I wasn't very good at empowering um, colleagues that I was that I, that I worked with and and devolving responsibility. Um, I suppose I was probably a bit of a micromanager, um, and and hopefully um, over the years that that's something I, I've become um, better at. I, I, I've matured. I, I, I've come to recognise the importance of of surrounding yourself with 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 really good people and people you can trust and and, and empowering them and, and letting them get on with with what they're good at um i, I think it probably helps to be honest as well sam when you get older you, you kind of lose a bit of energy as well <laughs> so um you you know you're no longer i suppose driven in quite in quite the same way that you that, that you know I, I was or that you are as a, as a, as a youngster um so I, yeah so i hope that i'm a I'm a better, more mature um, leader now than than, than I was. Um, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm still learning all the time. Uh, and I, I'm at the moment, I'm kind of really interested in in talking to um, CEOs and leaders from from other industries about um, how they lead and mentorship. You know, which is I think a, a, an important thing. But for for me, for for many many years, I, I was always like a sort of a number two, you know, or a number three. Um, and, and that's actually pretty good when you've got somebody who is a mentor to you and you can look up to and ask advice for and stuff like that. When you become the CEO, you don't have that anymore. You're, you're the person who, who people come to for advice. And, and that's quite a, it's quite a shift in, in, um, in, in mindset, I guess. And, um, um, and, uh, you know, I'm still to some extent trying to kind of work, work my way around that, even after, you know almost three years in, in the role. So yeah, these are areas that hopefully going forward, I, I can continue to, to, to develop in. And, and, um, and, and if I'm a, hopefully a better, a better leader, a better mentor, a, a better manager, then, then that will be hopefully be better for everybody um, in the rest of the organization. You still have to have all the answers always. So that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> um, you mentioned there about uh, leadership being, um, organic and it's always growing and you're still learning. I think that's a really important message actually. And um, no matter where you are in your career, uh, you always opportunities to develop and, and, and I think it's, it's a matter of seeking those opportunities as well. You mentioned reaching out to other CEOs and 
thinking about mentorship and learning off others. And I think the best leaders in the world are always, always developing, always learning. So uh, really, really strong message there. Thank you. Um, we'll finish off, if it's okay, with quickish fire questions. They're a little bit um, less, I guess, uh, <laughs> serious. So um, f feel free to take your time. It doesn't have to be yeah, really, really quick. But uh, <laughs> favourite food, Robbie, please. <laughs> Dim sum. Dim sum, lovely. Interesting fact about yourself. Um, when I was a youngster, I went. It's funny when you say quick fire questions. When I was a youngster, I appeared on the Blockbusters uh, TV game show in the UK. Excellent. Good to know. Favorite holiday destination. Bangkok. Uh, favorite book. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Anything by Bernard Cornwall. Thank you. Uh, may, most famous person you've met? Oh, um, hmm. Met Carly Minogue. Excellent. That is very famous. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and from a sporting perspective, famous person? Uh, most famous sporting person... Probably. Michael Johnson, probably the athlete or... 400 uh, runner for those who aren't aware of him, uh, super gold medalist, so uh, legendary. Was that with that was presumably through Laureus, was it? Is he an ambassador with Laureus? Yeah, I, although actually I'm not, I'm not showing off here, but I had a, a, a yes, I met him originally through Laureus, but I had a call with him last week. That's why, that's why I thought of his name. Excellent. Um, yeah, he's a good, good, good guy, very nice bloke. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, biggest piece of advice for 2021? <laughs> stay, stay positive. It'll all be over soon. <laughs> thank you. And finally, biggest life lesson? Um, <laughs> what here? Biggest life lesson, whenever you have the opportunity to do something good for somebody do somebody a favor take that opportunity because uh i'm a big believer that life is very balanced and what comes around goes around if you do somebody a favor somewhere down the line it will it'll come back and pay off for you so always make the effort try and do some of the good turn when you can brilliant thank you very much and i think that's an absolutely perfect way to end uh, Robbie, thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's been really insightful. Um, and once this is, goes, to, goes to press, I'm sure we'll be able to share it with you and uh, give you some feedback on uh, what the children think. So thank you so much. It's been really, really great. Uh, I know you've been Thanks, Sam. It's been a pleasure. All right. Catch you soon. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye.